everybody, and welcome to our second episode discussing Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Where did we leave off, you ask? We left off uh, page 31, and we read 31 through 50. It's a little bit shorter this time. Hopefully this uh, podcast is a, is a little bit shorter, a little more digestible uh, for you. First first episode we did 30 pages. But this episode I chose to do only 20. Only 20 pages. Let us begin then. Uh, we're going to do, I am going to post uh, some answers to those discussion questions, which you can find in the descriptions of, so if you go back to episode one in the description, you'll find those discussion questions and I'm going to post that. Um, you'll you'll find me post a separate video just talking about those questions. And we're going to have some more, as you can see from here. Let me make sure that I am recording. Uh, I just want to make sure that I'm recording on my computer which I should be. Yes, I am. Okay. Okay, sounds great. Um, where did we leave off? We left off at page 30, 31. And we saw some themes continue on throughout these pages. We saw the topics of food come up again. Uh, topics of like taking your mind off of the reality of what's happening in the camp. We also got some details about his wife. We also saw that he moved camps. He was transferred from Auschwitz to, I forget the camp. We're going to find it out later, but he, how they were super excited about it because it did not have any gas chambers. So they knew that the likelihood of them dying from that method uh, severely went down. Probably didn't go all the way away because if they wanted to kill you, they probably still could by other ways, but at least not having the gas chamber there, they couldn't just send you straight there right away as if it was on the same campus, same area as the prison was. So they were overjoyed about that. Um, he passes through his hometown, more traveling, um, more in the rail car. Uh, and we just, we keep going and revisiting some themes that were kind of brought up in the first 30 pages. So where did we leave off page 31? 31 right here is where right away he comes back to food. And how, I mean, how can you not? How can you not come back to food in, in, in a camp like this um, where food is essential for you to just make it by the day, even though you weren't getting that much? And he talks about how there were two schools of thought on food. As let's read from page 31. There were two schools, or this was 32. On page 32, he talks about how there were two schools of thought on food. One was in favor of eating the ration up immediately, and the other was dividing the ration up. So you can eat some later. So if one, eating it up right away, versus two, dividing... Fighting up the rations. You've heard him say a little bit about this before where I think last episode, if you were to, I don't think we discussed it, but in the first 30 pages, he talks about how he saw a prisoner being, I think, beaten or taken away somewhere. And he had some bread in his pocket that he would kind of just touch and like break off little pieces of throughout the day 
just to sustain himself a little bit. There was advantages and disadvantages to both of these. Obviously, if you eat it right away, he goes. He talks about this on 32, how you are guaranteed those calories, basically. Then you don't have to have it in your pocket. You don't have to risk maybe having it stolen or taken from you. God forbid that. Then you're left with nothing. Other than that, though, the advantages of dividing it up now you have some for later to get you maybe through the day if you can push past it. If you can push past the hunger pangs and save it until later. Now you have something later when other people don't. So I don't know which one would 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 you think is more advantageous. I think dividing it up, if you can make it, if you can ensure that nobody messes with it and it doesn't get taken, it would for me, I think that might be the the better option, to be honest with you. Um, food is such an interesting part of the story. Uh, he talks about how food was not about necessarily just the calories. Sustenance. It was not about the calories that it brought. He talks about this on page 31. That even the strong of us, of us was longing for the time when he would have a fairly good food again, not for the sake of food, of good food itself, but for the sake of knowing that the subhuman existence, which had made us unable to think of anything other than food, would at least cease. So what does good food represent? Good food represents the life outside of this camp. Probably... A lot better, right? So the they the food, you have a nice meal. You have your family around you. Maybe it's dinner time. You get home from work. You got your wife and kids around you, parents around you. You're discussing what happened through the day and just those conversations and the people around you. That's kind of what having good food kind of meant. Oh, and I'm sorry here. At the end of page 32, towards the bottom, this is where he talks about how he had a small piece of bread in his pocket that he had saved while he's watching somebody uh, cry like a child because he's got a march on his bare feet. And he took um, solace in (laughs) that bread that he had um, undernourishment. Because of the undernourishment, the conditions of the camp, the conditions of the prisoners, he talks about how there was no sexual urges, which you kind of you kind of thought like, well, yeah, it doesn't sound like there would be, doesn't sound like there would be, but let me just there's no sexual urges in camp. I guess it's different than if you talk, if you like in today's world, like prisons probably do have sexual urges, but in this camp, they, he talks about it. They really didn't. People had no time. People didn't waste their time with thinking about it. I mean, it's an all male camp. Sure. But you think about it, all male prisons kind of, they still have things that happen in there. Even though it's a prison, they still have things happen in there. Why is that? Maybe because they do have time to think about that. And the prisons today probably, they're taking care of prisoners a lot more than, I mean, this is the Holocaust we're talking about. They are organisms that he's, you know, as he described in the first uh, 30 pages. You know, they are literally less... They've lost all what it means to almost be human, which is why I think he started using that organism term. But he talks about how he was generally absent, no sexual urges, and I, we talked about how the man in the camp regresses to the most primitive instincts, survival. 
And I understand that you need the sexual urges to like propagate your seed and continue life. That's like one of the most basic things that you, in order for evolution to have, and you want your seed to keep, you want to protect your seed. You want to pass on your seed and have it keep growing. Right. But even in the camp, you, you got to talk about the most primitive, primitive survival, like instincts, food. That's the most important thing. And you're not concerning yourself with, with anything else. No way, dude. N nothing else. So I understand what he was saying here. Um, he talks about how they were transferred brought home to me on my transfer from Auschwitz to a camp affiliated affiliated with Dachau. Dachau. So here's a question for you guys. Um, is the camp at Dachau? Where is Dachau in relation to Auschwitz, and I think I spelled Auschwitz wrong there. Ah, Auschwitz. Here was my mistake. There we go. So, so just for as, as a reference, because he's going to be traveling, he's going to talk about traveling a couple times, and again, when they do it, they're in this rail car, uh, packed to the gills only way to look at the outside is through small barred peepholes. And he finds out that he travels through his native town. He travels through his native town, uh, heading for a camp at Matheson. And he has, like, visions. Distinct feeling that I saw the streets, the squares, and the houses of my childhood with the eyes of a dead man who had come back from another world and was looking down on a ghostly city. Wow. So the, the uh, a ghostly city, he in, on page 33. Um, and he's going to talk about how he wanted to get a glimpse of it, but they only had the two peoples, right? You only had the two peoples, and the other uh, prisoners on there uh, would not refuse his request to look through the peoples, saying basically that he had already lived here, so he had seen quite enough. I'm going to read you the exact quote here. It's it's funny the amount of humor that you sometimes kind of can feel from the words that Victor's writing and the stories he's telling. And we're going to talk about humor a little bit later. A uh, prisoner told him, you lived here all those years. Well, then you have seen quite enough already, you know, with an exclamation point. So I wonder what the kind of tone, if he's, it almost sounds like a humorous tone that Victor's trying to convey here. There was... Um, the tragic, page 34 here, the tragic uh, optimist, incorrigible optimist. So there was people in the camp, there was political and religious talk in the camp, um, political talk in regards to like what was happening with the war, what people thought was happening with the war, because maybe probably they did not really get news the same as maybe somebody outside of a camp who could probably give the news more readily. It probably took a long, lot longer of a time to trickle down to the prisoners. And obviously not in like news like today, Twitter, uh, social media, 24-7 uh, news channel. But he was talking about how he did not like, there was a lot of people that, that the prisoners that would, be overly, overly optimistic, optimistic prisoners. And, and I think he uses this word, 
incorrigible. This is how he incorrigible prisoners. What I'm getting from this is that they were annoying, thinking that they uh, were hoping for a speeding end to the war. To the war. Optimistic rumors. And they were incorrigible. They were irritating companions. He uses that word. Incorrigible. Irritating. Is that how you spell it? Oh, there you go. That's how you spell it. Irritating. And I could get that. You're in a camp. You don't know when it's going to end. You just got to worry about the next day. You don't want somebody telling you, oh, I heard this rumor. Oh, it's going to end soon. And then it doesn't. Now you're disappointed. Now, in the state you're in, you have to deal with that disappointment. That's just another layer on top of you that you probably do not want. However, Victor does talk about how the importance of needing to like, escape from the, from the state of the camp using humor, art, nature, dreams. So he talks about these ways to escape, but the incorrigible optimist, this isn't really welcomed, and he finds it irritating from the optimism of that. So what is the difference? That's going to be a question I pose. What is the difference between the incorrigible optimist and escaping camp life via via what am I saying here? Humor, art, nature. What is the difference between those things? If there is any difference at all. Tell me what you guys think. Uh, religious, uh, there was a religious interest in the camp. Um, they did gather sometimes for prayers or services. Um, and I, I think that that would have been pretty big in the camp. Um, he goes on to talk about a typhus outbreak. And I think there was another typhus outbreak in the first 30 pages if I'm not mistaken. Um, he, in Typhus, I am not even sure. Typhus, all the typhus fever, is a group of infectious diseases that include epidemic to scrub typhus. Caused by bacteria? Acquired, oh, okay, so like maybe a tick-borne disease? And yes, he does talk, he talks about, I'm sorry, I'm reading from, from Google, from uh, Wikipedia here, typhus fever is a group of infectious diseases that include epidemic typhus, scrub typhus, murine typhus, common symptoms include fever, headache, rash, typically these begin one to two weeks after exposure, it looks like you can get it caused by bacteria or you, it's acquired through a tick bite or some small insect arthropod. Uh, Victor did contract typhus. He did. And he survived it, he talks about, by staying sane, basically is, is, is what it sounds like. Because his symptoms that they, they he writes in the book, worst delirium and an irreversible aversion to even a scrap of food. How dangerous would that be? You're not you don't have like any sort of hunger and you need to eat to survive. He said that he survived by uh, keeping the delirium at bay by composing speeches in his mind. By composing speeches in his mind. 
啊。And he said that he was able to, I think, reproduce that manuscript that was taken from him earlier in the book, when he tried to keep that book, and he found out that he wasn't going to be able to keep anything. And he scribbled the keywords on a shorthand on a tiny scraps of paper. Um, so he did that to keep his mind just working still, and not to go into a state of delirium. Delirium. I'm assuming you're just kind of like crazy is an abrupt change in the brain that causes mental confusion, emotional uh, disruption, makes it difficult to think. So yeah, he just, it sounds like he just kept his, kept his mind just sharp by doing this. The next uh, further down 35, this is where he talks about being part of a seance. This was really interesting. Uh, they gathered in a group with a prayer. Uh, they, I'm reading from here, the medium, <laughs> the medium, uh, at which time the seance was terminated <laughs> during the next 10 minutes. Seance was terminated because of the medium's failure to conjure the spirits to appear. I wonder what what kind of tone, if this is another kind of like humorous tone that Victor's using, because he's describing it. The medium, he had a pencil, drew lines across a paper, formed a ve V. So ve V. Um, v A E. That's that's this is what Victor writes. Ve V. And it was uh, had to do with lact uh, Latin. Ve victus is what the medium was trying to write by it. Uh, is what the medium meant by writing that ve v, which means woe to the vanquished. And Victor right away just kind of shoots it down. Um, I don't think there. I don't think he thought it was real. It was real. The seance. Um, because he writes, you know, in my opinion, he must have heard them once in his life without recollecting them, and they must have been available to the spirit, quote-unquote. And Victor says the spirit of his unconscious mind at that time a few months before our liberation and the end of the war. Um, so in Victor's opinion, this is just something that he heard before, and he's saying, quote-unquote, it's a spirit, but in real reality, it's a subconscious mind. But I wonder, in the state that the prisoners are in, how many of them do you think believed it? Sounds like not a lot. Um, Victor doesn't really talk about it, but I wonder how many of them believed in it. Because like I said, religion was a... It sounded like religion was pretty big. Um, Victor didn't touch on it in these pages, but didn't go into detail, I should say, in these pages, but they did have prayers and services in the corner of a hut or in the darkness of a locked cattle truck, etc. I thought that was very interesting. Interesting. Page 36. Page 36. The sensitive survive. Not the hardened. Victor says the sensitive were more likely to survive. And this kind of, I, I didn't really understand this. I didn't get how sensitive, they, sensitive people could survive the camps. I thought that be, if you were emotionally weak, physically weak, spiritually weak, you had nothing to live for, then you would let your life be taken from you. But no, sensitive people who are used to a rich intellectual life may have suffered much pain, but the damage to their inner selves was less. They were able to retreat from their terrible surroundings to a life of inner riches and spiritual freedom. Okay, so not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean emotional weakness, uh, spiritual weakness. 
maybe physical weakness, because he does say, only in this way can one explain the apparent paradox that some prisoners of a less hardy makeup often seem to survive camp life better than the does of a robust nature. Hmm. So the sensitive... We're able to retreat to inner riches. Inner riches. Whereas maybe you got like a big, strong guy. He thinks he can take on everything physically. And he's not really working on the mental, the mental aspect of it in his inner self. I'm going to pose that question here. I'm going to call it the sensitive paradox. I thought that was really interesting. Um, let's continue on. And we finally get a glimpse. Victor talking about his wife. Uh, this enters enters the fray and he, he gives his thoughts, his thoughts on love in how love is though is the means by which a man survives at camp that is physical strength spiritual strength his muscles and during the fast it's it's his love so somebody they're marching and the guy who's marching next to him makes a comment again humor in a way i think victor was uh, conveying humor here if our wives could see us now, I do hope they are better off in their camps and I don't know what is happening to us. So somebody whispered this to him while they were uh, outside marching uh, in the icy wind. And this brought about thoughts of his own wife to mind. This is on page 37. And he starts thinking about his wife, looked up to the sky, Occasionally I looked at the sky where the stars were fading and the pink of light, pink light of the morning was beginning to spread behind a dark bank of clouds. But my mind clung to my wife's image, imagining it with an uncanny acuteness. And he heard her answering me, saw her smile, her encouraging look. So this is interesting. He's having thoughts of his wife visions of his wife not necessarily seeing her but hearing her and his wife uh, does die we find out um i don't know when he f would find it out if he found it out in camp or afterwards but it sounds like she was taken to a camp and he does mention like her you know he mentions her birthday like how she would have been 24 today and uh, that she did uh, die. Thinks of his wife of uh, visions. Here's her. And this is where Victor has a revelation he talks about at the end of page 37. A thought transfixed me for the first time in my life. I saw the truth as it is sent into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers. And what is that? That love is the ultimate and the highest goal to which a man can aspire. Then I grasp the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. I was not expecting to hear that. And I'm going to pose that question. Do you... that love and what were the words that he used again salvation of man is through love and in love so in other words if you have something if you have a loved one you can make it through camp better do you think that's what he meant by it hmm. it's very interesting and i was not expecting him to think think about that i thought it was more so to do with like if you have a meaning, meaning is the salvation of man because that's what the book title is. 
but yeah, I was not expecting him to 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 hear that. So that that was um, I'm going to pose that question. Do you agree with Victor that love is the salvation of man? And let me know what you think about that. Continuing on page 38. What do we have here? Talks more about love on page 38. Uh, they go to a new site. They're picking out tools. And then he says at the bottom, my mind still clung to the image of my wife. I didn't even know if she was alive. I knew only one thing, which I have learned well by now. Love goes very far beyond the physical person of the beloved, finds its deepest meaning in in his spiritual being, his inner self. Okay, yeah. Like if you have a strong spiritual sense, strong um, spiritual realization, I am without a doubt that that would help during these times for sure. And the last quote in this paragraph, set me like a seal upon thy heart. Love is as strong as death. And this is where he first mentions his wife uh, being dead. Had I known that my wife was dead, I think that I would still have given myself undisturbed by that knowledge to the contemplation of her image. And then my mental conversation with her would have been just as vivid. Talks about that on page 39. Wow. So he does find out somehow that his wife is dead. I don't know. I don't know how he doesn't describe it yet. But yeah, his his wife uh, did end up dying. Let's continue on. The intensification of inner life helped the prisoner find a refuge from the emptiness, desolation, and spiritual poverty of his existence by letting him escape into the past. His imagination played with past events, often not important ones. So escaping into the past to deal with what you were going through in the present. And I'm kind of paraphrasing that a a little bit, but let's write that down into the In the present. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. Um, Find a refuge from the emptiness. Uh, Continuing down page 39. In his mind, he took bus rides, unlocked the front door of my apartment, answered my telephone. Our thoughts often centered on such details, and these memories could move one to tears. So these aren't the, the memories here he's describing are not like significant like a child being born, you getting your promotion and at work, um, you, you know, proposing to your wife, you, you know, teaching your son how to hunt or fish, like momentous moments in a man's life. These are just simple ones. Bus ride, unlocking the front door. answering the telephone, switching on an electric light. These were the moments that moved one to tears. And those simple moments did that. These, what you thought were simple, what you probably took for granted, those were the moments that moved him to tears. I thought that was very, very interesting. This is where he talks about the art. As the inner life of the prisoner tended to become more intense, he also experienced the beauty of art and nature like never before. And I can imagine you don't have much to look around at. So nature becomes very important. I don't know what the conditions were like. They do talk about how they were in, they could see mountains. uh, They were surrounded by forests. He's going to talk about the sunset and how it's set a couple times. Somebody actually ran 
to like the group he was with and said, hey, hey, come look. You got to check out the sunset. They were, it sounded like they eagerly went with them because things like that, you, when they happen, you got to appreciate, especially being where you are in the present moment. Let's continue on page 40. Oh, I think this was it. Page 40, he describes the sunset here. Um, and excuse me, before I even go there, he says right here at the top of 40, we were carried away by nature's beauty, which we had missed for so long. Hmm. Missed for so long. So I guess before in the camp, they didn't have that much access to nature. Then when he was moved, more access to nature. It sounds like, I mean, he talks about them passing the Salzburg Mountains with their summits glowing in the sunset through the little barred windows of the prison carriage. Okay, yes. Uh, page 40, this is where he talks about a fellow prisoner rushed in and asked us to run out to the assembly grounds to see the wonderful sunset. Standing outside, we saw sinister clouds glowing in the west and the whole sky alive with clouds ever-changing shapes and colors from steel blue to blood red. The desolate gray mud huts provided a sharp contrast while the puddles in the muddy ground reflected the glowing sky. Then, after minutes of moving silence, one prisoner said to another how beautiful the world could be. So nature was kind of another way to escape into the past, more so escape into nature. Let's call it that. Escaping into nature to get away from your present condition and finding that beauty in nature, finding that beauty in God. What probably some people are thinking, I would not doubt, And I think this is where, oh, he again brings up his wife here. He, he talks about, I was struggling to find reasons for my sufferings. He was conversing silently with his wife. Um, from some kind of victorious, yes. A, a light in the distance. Um, for hours I stood hacking the icy ground. More and more, I felt that she was present and she was with me. So a guard passed by him, insulting him, and he just communed with his with his wife. And the more and more, he, he felt like she was present with him. This was very cool here. The feeling was very strong. She was there. Then at the very moment, a bird flew down silently and perched just in front of me on the heap of soil which I had dug up from the ditch and looked steadily at me. Very interesting. Do you, do you think that bird was his wife? Or maybe reincarnated or the bird represented? Definitely getting that the bird represents his wife. It's kind of a I don't know, weird question, but what do you think about that? Basically, what do you think about that bird? He makes it a point right there. He ends the paragraph and then he goes on. So obviously there's a, he thinks a lot of it and it sounds like Victor is very religious, um, believes in God. Uh, he talks about his parents. Remember um, his parents taking the, uh, one of the 10 commandment uh, letters from the synagogue. Um, it, it sounds like he's devout and he believes, he believes in something. I'll say that, believes in something. Early, this is Victor talking, uh, 41. Earlier I had mentioned art. Is there such a thing in a concentration camp? And it rather depends on what one chooses to call art. So this is something that maybe you guys might have been a little bit confused on when I said art. Are you talking about drawings? Um, paintings? And art can be a lot. I mean, there's and, and what Victor gets at here, performance art. And he talks about how, again, humor. Think about comedy today, stand-up comedy, improv, a performance art. 
He talks about they had performed a kind of cabaret improvised from time to time. Uh, Capos would come in. Uh, they would have a few laughs. There were songs. So this, so this is um, the type of the type of arts songs. Maybe not physical like sculptures, uh, models, art, you know, paintings, etc. But songs, poems, jokes, poems, and jokes. And they were saying how if they were funny at their lunches, if they were funny, like the people serving lunches remembered them. And if they were funny, they would give them like an extra, like extra food or maybe not the extra food, but they would get, uh, they would <laughs> go straight to the bottom of soups to get um, extra peas for them if they like performed well. And humor was big. All were meant to help us forget, and they did help. Here's the interesting thing. All were meant to help us forget, and they did help. So humor, art, helped them forget about the condition they were in. But he talks about earlier how he did not think that dwelling on food, this was in the first 30 pages, if you guys remember, about how not to dwell on food. Do you remember this? He talks about like prisoners would think about like, you know, food, cake, you know, having like a good meal. And he said like it almost did them no good. It almost did them no good. And I don't know. I don't know if I wrote anything in here. Yeah, I don't think I wrote anything on the PowerPoints. Um, but art was okay, but thinking about the food like that, not okay. Or at least, I don't want to say not okay, but he just didn't find any use for it. So what what is the difference between art and thinking about a good meal? Mm. That's a hard one. I don't I don't know because I think anything to escape the situation you're in all we're meant to help us forget. Right? If food helps you forget, then yeah. Why not? Is there a difference or are they one and the same? And is it just something that Victor didn't want to personally do? I'm not sure. Ah uh, yes, the murderous capo. Um, this again, how how humor is used throughout this, and you wouldn't think it would be. But he has this story, the murderous capo story. So this was on page uh, forty-two. Murderous capo. I believe this was at a. So what happened here? I believe this was at another seance. Yep, uh, he was invited to a spiritual seance and uh, the most dreaded capo, the murderous capo, was there in attendance. There were gathered the same intimate friends of the chief doctor and most illegally warrant officer from the sanitation squad. Murderous capo entered the room. He was asked to recite one of his poems, <laughs> which had become famous or infamous in camp. And he quickly produced a kind of diary from which he began to read samples of his art. And he, Victor talks about having to bite his lip till they hurt in order to keep from laughing at one of his poems. <laughs> at one of his poems. <laughs> Wow. The humor in this. I mean, it's it's crazy. And he said that how likely that that saved his life. What he did was after the capo finished telling that story, he clapped, applauded like he never applauded before. That's my paraphrasing right there. 
um, because he wanted to make it known and he wanted to get in good favor with that capo <laughs> since I was also generous with my applause. My life might have been saved even had I been detailed to his working party. The murderous capo, um, it was useful anyway to be known to the murderous capo from a favorable, favorable angle, so I applauded as hard as I could. It's funny. The humor in this, I mean, it's, I'll say it again, it's just, you wouldn't think it, but to escape the present moment, like Victor talks about. Here is where um, he talks about his wife. And I'm trying to find the passage. This is where his wife, his wife's birthday would have been. Ah, okay. Suddenly there was a silence. The violin, this is on page 43. The violin wept and part of me wept with it. For on that same day, someone had a 24th birthday. That someone lay in another part of Auschwitz camp, possibly only a few hundred or a thousand yards away and yet completely out of reach. That someone was my wife. So here, the first we hear about his wife's death and that she would have been 24. Very young. I wonder how old Victor was uh, in this time, actually. Um, and then we can we uh, we continue on. And again, going back to humor... Right here on 43, humor was another of the soul's weapons in the fight for self-preservation. It is well known that humor, more than anything else in the human makeup, can afford an aloofness and an ability to rise above any situation, even if only for a few seconds. So that's kind of why Victor seems like he's got a humorous tone to in, in, this, in these pages. He tells some funny stories. There's some funny jokes, etc. Um, and then here he's going to talk about a joke about how a guard would come in, yell at them, saying "action, action!" if they if he wanted them to work harder. And he leans over to uh, talk to one of his uh, one of his fellow prisoners, and he's saying who was a doctor like a surgeon, and that one day he'd be back in the operating room performing a big abdominal abdominal operation, and then suddenly an orderly would rush in and say, action, action. So it's crazy. And then sometimes the other men um, were forecasting future engagement parties and thinking that when they were going through a buffet line, they would ask the people serving, like, oh, ladle it from the bottom, you know, to get more peas. But this this is in real life. So humor, very big. Very big. Um, 44, we get to a, a different concept here. Before uh, he talks about moving, moving to a new camp. Suffering is relative and maybe I'll pose that question suffering is relative hmm. Victor states suffering is omnipresent and to draw an analogy a man's suffering is similar to the behavior of gas very interesting. So it is relative. So if a certain quantity of a gas is pumped into an empty chamber, it will fill the chamber completely, no matter how big the chamber. Suffering completely fills the human soul and conscious mind. Excuse me. No matter what, no matter whether the suffering is great or little. Therefore, the size of human suffering is absolutely relative. Hmm. Do you agree with that? So suffering is like a gas. Is consuming. No matter how much little, little suffering you have, it is consuming. Potentially consuming you. And I kind of see this in my life. When you have that one little thought, and there's been books written about this, um, one that comes to mind, the compound effect. 
the compound effect talks about. Let me see if I can pull it. I'll pull it up here for you guys to see. Oh, the compound effect, because I forget the author. Darren Hardy, that's right. This basically talks about how um, you... Let me get a picture for you guys. This book, yep. How when you do one little thing, it it starts the train moving, and eventually that one little thing ends up being like a very big deal. So how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? You start off, the, the, the task is big, but if you just start off like this one little little subtask, and then that gives you like the energy and you carry that momentum to help you finish something. So in a way, I think this is what he means by suffering, is that you have this one little thought, and then all of a sudden things can go us south quickly if those if that suffering is not checked quickly that little suffering can consume your whole body like gas in a chamber i think that is a good analogy and i do i think i agree with with victor here on the suffering thing it is absolutely relative dependent on depending on the person because I'm sure some people took camp really, really hard. Some people just took it really hard, right? And then now he is getting moved camps. Page 45. Not crossing the bridge was said only for to show. Um, again, in the, in the trains, they come to a camp. Uh, what was this camp's name? camp affiliate with the show we had been afraid to be transferred that our transferred so he he went from Auschwitz to a camp affiliate with the show camp affiliate and he was so happy when he got here because they had no oven no crematorium and no no gas that meant that a person who had become a Muslim could not be taken straight to the gas chamber but would have to wait until a so-called sick convoy had been arranged to return from Auschwitz. This joyful surprise put us all in a good mood. They didn't have a chimney. Everybody laughed, cracked jokes, etc. So that must have been um, a huge relief. And I'm sure that it, uh, you know, it, yeah, it brought some relief to them to know to know that. But like I said, if they wanted to kill you, I'm sure they still had ways. I'm sure they still had ways, but this, you know, when when you deal with the conditions of this camp, one little victory like that, again, compound effect, I'm sure it goes a long way. I'm sure it does. Let's continue on here. Hmm. Talks about how he they wanted to work inside would have been better than working outside because you had a shelter from the conditions of like winter rain uh weather etc uh page 47 freedom from suffering the meager pleasures of camp life provided a kind of negative happiness freedom from suffering a shop Schopenhauer put it. Real positive pleasures, even small ones, were very few. Hmm. But he drew a balance sheet of pleasures, kept track of them. And he describes one, one of them where he was admitted to a cookhouse, assigned to the line, filling up to prisoner cook F something, um, the name is blanked out. What was the story? Oh. The only cook who dealt out the soup equally. Hmm. While others got watery soup. I forgot where I was going with this. 
Who can throw a stone at a man who favors his friends under circumstances when sooner or later it is a question of life or death? No man should judge unless he asks himself in absolute honesty whether in a similar situation he might not have done the same. Mm. This is page 48. This is page 48. So hang on. I'm going to write this down for you guys. Freedom from suffering. He talks about judgment. Talking about judgment here. It is not for him to pass judgment. I don't. I think that would be the last thing you'd want to do in this camp. Hold grudges. You know, have that emotional toil on you. You're already going through an emotional thing. Can't judge people, especially because everybody's trying to do the same thing, right? If somebody does something. Maybe you get upset for a second, but then you think he's just doing that to survive. I would do the same thing in his situation. I think that's what Victor meant here on page 48. No man should judge unless he asks himself in absolute honesty whether in a similar situation he might have not have done the same. I think it rings true. Absolutely. Let's continue on here. Let's continue on. Page 48. And we're almost done. Here's page 50. I'm going through my notes. Sorry, guys. I mentioned earlier how everything that was connected with the immediate task of keeping oneself and one's closest friends alive lost its value. Everything was sacrificed to this end. A man's character became involved to the point that he was caught in mental turmoil, which threatened all the values he held, threw them into doubt. A world which no longer recognized the value of human life and human dignity, which had robbed man of his will and had made him an object to be exterminated. Suffered a loss in values. If the man in the concentration camp did not struggle against this in a last effort to save his self-respect, he lost the feeling of being an individual, a being with the mind, with inner freedom and personal value. He thought of himself then as only a part of an enormous mass of people. His existence descended to a level of animal life. The men were herded like sheep. They were driven back and forth. And that he goes on to a different kind of subject there. But this is some deep stuff that Victor talks about here. Very deep stuff. If the man in the concentration camp did not struggle against this in a last effort to save his self-respect, he lost the feeling of being an individual, a being with a mind, with inner freedom, personal value. He thought of himself then as only a part of an enormous mass of people. His existence descended to the level of animal life. The men were herded. Speechless. What does he mean by this? Against this in a last effort. Let's just pose that question to you guys. And then we're going to wrap this up because that was page 50. What did loss of values... And again, this was page 50. I am going to have to deep dive into this because it's kind of a long passage here. Wow. Guys, thank you very much for sticking around, those of you that did. And if you, even if you didn't, thank you for checking this out. Uh, next week, 
uh, for next week, I am going to read pages 51 through 70. 51 through 70. So tune in next week for that. Um, I will have the discussion posted for this. Got to have. I want to try to do it by by Wednesday. Let's say that would be a good time Wednesday. And I really appreciate you guys. Um, let me know the what you think about the discussion questions. Post them um, uh, just in the comments. And thanks again. Uh, this is Cheetash, Chris. Chris Lazar, and thank you.